Have you ever noticed how well bees work together? Cooperation is the name of the game when it comes to survival for a colony of bees. They communicate with each other, defend each other, help take care of the baby bees and the queen. But why do they do this? Do other animals also benefit from this cooperative behavior? Let's find out together in this episode all about group behavior. Group behaviors involve groups of organisms engaging in the same behavior at the same time that generally benefit the survival of the entire group. Unlike individual behaviors that involve single organisms carrying out behaviors that just generally benefit themselves. Survival is the top priority for all organisms. So if animals work together and they do well, they are going to pass that behavior on to their offspring. In the same way, if working together really doesn't help, then there's no point in passing on that behavior. Group behaviors are found in organisms ranging from unicellular slime molds to bees to primates, which includes us humans. So how do organisms interact in groups so they themselves as individuals are benefited? Let's figure it out by exploring several different animal groups to take a look at the benefits of anti-predator behavior, hunting and foraging behavior, and social structure. One major benefit to living in a group is that you're less likely to be eaten, which is a huge plus. More individuals looking for predators means an early detection system and tons of friends to sound the alarm. Prairie dogs live in grasslands throughout the Great Plains in North America. These mammals are very social and live in large colonies or towns in underground burrows and also share the responsibilities to look out for predators. While other prairie dogs are foraging for seeds plants, or the occasional grasshopper, a few prairie dogs will become lookouts and watch out for coyotes, birds of prey, or currently, this human. Can you hear them? Prairie dogs have a highly sophisticated language. Not only do they make high-pitched barks and yips to warn about the presence of predators, but they actually have different warnings for different predator types as well. Once one prairie dog starts the warning, others will continue, and soon the whole town will be yipping and jumping to spread the alarm. Not only will the prairie dogs protect the town from predators, but they are also highly territorial and will keep outsiders away from their family. They have a special system of distinguishing who's in and who's out. When individuals meet one another out on the prairie or at the burrow entrance, they engage in what scientists refer to as a greet kiss. This isn't as wholesome as it sounds. They actually lock teeth with one another. Awkward. The teeth lock somehow allows the prairie dogs to tell if they are members of the same group. If they are, they carry on. If not, they either fight off the intruder or a high-speed chase ensues. Large groups of potential prey may be able to physically overwhelm predators. Adult elephants protect their young when they see a threat approaching. The young elephants are much more vulnerable than the adults, so the entire group of elephants will circle around the young, not just the parents. Giant river otters take it a step further and not only physically repel predators, but can even kill caiman attempting to prey upon them, something they could not do alone. Oh, how the tables have turned. Crows are also known for this mobbing behavior. They band together and cooperatively attack or harass a predator, usually to protect their offspring. The crows are typically going after some type of hawk. Safety really is in numbers. If you travel in a flock, herd, or school, the more individuals there are to choose from, the less likely it's you who is chosen. In other words, the dilution effect created by the presence of more individuals decreases the risk of predation for each individual. Not to mention, if all of your friends are just running for seemingly no reason, you get to copy them and just run away from whatever the threat may be without ever actually having to see it. Possibly the craziest way that groups avoid predation is called the predator confusion effect. This theory is based on the idea that when so many moving targets group closely together, it becomes difficult for predators to pick out individual prey because of the sensory overload of the predator's visual channel. Kind of like when someone wears a disturbingly patterned shirt, you get dizzy or nauseous just looking at it. 
Hanging out in groups means that there are more individuals to forage or hunt for food. Even though this increases intraspecific competition for resources, having more individuals in a group means greater odds of success when foraging for food or cooperative hunting. Foraging in groups can increase the amount of food gathered for the group and decrease the amount of time needed to forage. In addition, it can allow for important learned behaviors to be passed on to the next generation from older individuals. Honeybees have a fascinating way of foraging as a group. Forager honeybees work not only as gatherers of food for their colonies, but also as little sensory units refined by natural selection to gather location and profitability information of forage sites. Profitability is important because in any instance of gathering a meal, an organism has to weigh the amount of energy that they will spend in order to gain those calories. It wouldn't make sense to use just as much energy flying to a flower and back as the food source provided to the group. They transmit this information to the colony members by means of waggle dances. Honeybees collect two main food resources from flowers, nectar and pollen. Their goal is to find the flowers with the most of these two resources. They do this by specializing in one resource at a time, either nectar or pollen. Then bees look for and remember what flower species are the most rewarding. This usually changes depending on the season or even the weather. So a species of flower that had tons of nectar one month might not be the species with the most nectar the next month. The same is true for pollen. Once a good flower is discovered, the bee collects the resource they were after and returns to the hive. Then she dances to tell other members of her colony where to find the flower so they can go and collect more resources from it. This dance is called the waggle dance, and it tells the watching bees two things about the flower species location, the distance and direction from the hive. The dancing bee also shares a sample of nectar she collected with them. She does this by regurgitating a sample of the nectar for them to taste. If you're still here liking this video, let us know and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Group living also allows for cooperative or pack hunting behavior. Predators such as chimpanzees, lions, wolves, and wells participate in pack hunting behavior. Pack hunting involves predator groups of various size working together to subdue prey. This behavior allows predators to take down prey species that would normally be too large or too strong for an individual. The African lion is probably the most impressive pack hunter. Female lions hunt in groups to take down a variety of prey species. The largest of all, the African elephant. Adult African elephants are far too large for any single predator to prey upon. They're just too huge. And just look at those tusks. Plus, they could just step on you. But in large groups, these lions have figured out how to gradually wear down and prey upon these gigantic mammals. Similarly, wolves hunt in packs and can coordinate to successfully hunt bison who are 10 times larger. This takes a large group and a good strategy. But if a hunt is successful, the energy reward is huge. While some groups are stable over long periods of time, others are fluid with new members moving in and out. Groups can even dissolve if their size or purpose becomes counterproductive or if the dominant members lose their place. Groups can be structured as collections of equal individuals, individuals similar in age, small families, or hierarchies with dominant members. Some groups assign specialized tasks or jobs to each member, and sometimes all members perform the same or similar functions. Worker bees here at the hive, rather than specializing in one job, progress through the colony responsibilities in a predictable order based on their age. Work begins as soon as they emerge. Each worker bee must clean her cell and help clean out the surrounding cells from where her fellow worker bees were born, and then prepare the cells for another set of eggs. Once this is finished, she will then start tending to the hive's brood, the still developing bees like a nurse. Eventually, if chosen, due to her work ethic, she will tend to the queen, providing constant feeding and grooming while she continues to lay eggs throughout the day. Then, around eight to 10 days old, the worker bees can move on and progress through other responsibilities in the hive. Jobs like grooming and feeding her fellow sisters and even assisting in ventilating the hive 
which is a super interesting process for another episode. After 15 to 25 days, she can either become a forager if the colony is in dire need, or stay within the hive to help with the storage of nectar and pollen. As the worker bee continues to grow, again, depending on the need of the colony, she will develop the necessary muscles in her wings to help carry the additional load of nectar and pollen. Between 25 to 45 days old, she has now reached the point where she can be considered a forager and is able to cover great distances in search of food. Prairie dogs typically live in family groups within the larger colony. Families consist of one male, multiple females, and their offspring. This social structure limits the contact between individuals of different family groups, which can reduce the transmission of diseases within the population, resulting in increased reproductive success. In a prairie dog colony, a phenomenon known as the selfish herd is observed. This theory states that the risk of predation to an individual is reduced if that individual places another individual between themselves and the predator, which sounds an awful lot like I don't have to outrun a bear, I just have to outrun whoever's with me. When many individuals act this way, an aggregation is the inevitable result, which means because the risk is least near the center and greatest at the edge, individuals of high social status or dominance will tend to occupy the center and subordinate individuals will be pushed to the edge. Well, that's one way to ensure that the best genetics get passed on. Yikes. So work together. Sometimes it can seem like more work up front, or maybe it's just more annoying, which is fair. But if you want to go far, go together. And if you want to learn more science, you can check out this video next, is the natural result. Do you see that butterfly? Family groups.